Welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jiming Ma from Princeton University. Uh, Jiming is uh, doing his PhD there under the advice of uh, Mark Braverman and he will tell us about algorithms and strategic or noisy environments today. So. All right. Thank you for the introduction. So, okay. I'm going to talk about algorithms in strategic or noisy environments. Uh, all right. So I, when I first learned algorithms, I think it as a following figure. So the, it takes some input and produces some output. Uh, however, in uh, some scenarios, algorithms are interacting with agents. These agents can be very strategic. They want to maximize their own utility functions. Um, sometimes they are not that strategic, but uh, due to many reasons, for example, uh, limit of knowledge, or uh, not spending enough effort, or subjective preferences, they can, their data, the data they provided might be noisy. Okay? And the point is, uh, these factors sometimes can completely change the solutions of the problems. So it's very important to take them into account if we want to design algorithms for these settings. Okay. I'm going to talk about uh, two projects in this direction. It's a very general direction. Uh, the first one is uh, we can see the following scenario. So there's a seller repeatedly sell goods to a buyer. And uh, the seller is fully strategic while the buyer is using a no regret learning algorithms to learn over time. And we want to understand uh, what will happen if a buyer try to use a no regret learning algorithm against a fully strategic seller. Okay. That's the first part. And in the second project, um, the problem is motivated by applications like crowdsourcing. So we consider a very simple problem. You want to find, uh, so you have a bunch of items and you want to find the top K of them uh, by asking uh, people on the crowdsourcing platform. You ask them uh, pairwise comparison queries and uh, these uh, people, they are not that strategic, but uh, at least the, the, their answers can be noisy. Okay? And we want to study how to design algorithms in this setting. Uh, in the end, I talk about some future directions related to these two problems. Okay? So let's start with the uh, first problem. Um, so we consider the scenario bidders participate in repeated auctions. And many of these auctions are not truthful, so it's not clear how to bid. So this opens the potential of using an online learning algorithm to decide how to bid. Okay. And there's some evidence by this paper showing that bidder's behavior is largely consistent with uh, no regret learning. Okay. So we notice uh, that uh, these uh, standard no regret learning algorithms are not designed to be used against a fully strategic seller. So we ask uh, the following question. If the seller knows beforehand that the bidders are no regret learning over time, can the seller extract additional revenue? So I define what do I mean by additional revenue later. A uh, quick answer to this question is yes, even when there's only one buyer and the seller is selling single item in each round. Okay. So let me formally define the model. Um, so there's a buyer, and in each round, a value is sampled from uh, some fixed distribution. Uh, this distribution is also known to the seller. And what the seller can do, the seller can offer some bidding options. Uh, each option will come up with uh, two parameters. One is the allocation probability, one is the price. Okay. So if the bidder bids B, then the bidder will get an item with probability Xt of B, and the bidder will be charged some price Pt of B. Okay. These uh, parameters have some uh, properties that are not very important. And uh, in addition, we uh, require that uh, there's always a bid called zero. Basically, if you bid zero, you get the item with zero probability and you 
uh, don't need to pay anything. Okay, so this is like the bidder can always the buyer can always decide not to participate in that round. Okay, and uh, okay, the buyer will in each round will just select a bid, and uh, buyer will learn the, uh, the these two parameters after the round. Okay, so this is like the bandit setting. You only learn the parameters of the bid you choose. It. Uh, our results also work for the uh, expert setting where the uh, buyers learns all the parameters. All right. Okay. So this is the model. There's an additional definition. Uh, as we said, the, the buyer is no regret learning over time. So what does that mean? So we define B of V to be the best B for some value V. So, so here in the, in the here, uh, this term is basically the utility. So it's a value times the probability you get item minus the price you pay. Okay. So basically, for a value, we define some bid that is the best for this value okay, over all rounds. And the no regret basically says that what the buyer gets is not much worse than using the best bid for each uh, value. Okay. Okay. So this is a setting. Right. Any questions? So this, the mechanism is fixed. Uh, you mean the seller strategy? Yeah. Uh, so it is also changing with time. Yeah, so the seller can change, can change uh, the strategy over time. And also, the seller is not telling the buyer these two parameters before it's wrong. It's even OK if you tell the buyer these two parameters, because the buyer is just using a no regret learning. But uh, in general, you don't learn the probability you get item before the auction is finished. Right? All right. So OK. <laughs> Oops. There are two interpretations of this model. <coughs> The first one is that uh, there's only one buyer, and in each round, the value is drawn from some distribution uh, independently. And the seller knows the distribution, but doesn't know the realized value of the distribution. And this buyer tries to know regret learns separately for each value. There's a, another dis uh, interpretation. So there's a bunch of buyers. Each, each of them has a fixed value. Um, and in each round, only one of them participate in, in the auction. Okay? And the seller doesn't know which buyer comes. Okay? And each, of the, each buyer separately, no regret learns. Okay? So you can pick your favorite uh, interpretation. Uh, all right, let me tell you our results. Okay. So uh, we first show that if the buyer is using some uh, standard no regret learning algorithm like exp3 uh, actually we we basically define something called the mean based algorithms as long as the uh, no regret learning algorithm is in this category the optimal seller revenue is uh, the full expected welfare okay so this is uh, very large and if the seller is getting this revenue that means that the buyer's utility is at most a small o of t, even if the buyer gets all the items. So basically, this uh, revenue is the best we can hope for uh, up to some additive small o of t terms. Okay. Um, then we show the second theorem. So there exists a, a no regret learning algorithm tailored for this setting such that actually the seller's revenue is not very high. Okay. So it's equal to this term. It's, bas uh, it's basically t times the optimal revenue you can get by selling the item for run round using a truth for mechanism. Okay. So here, capital F means the CDF function, and uh, p is the price 1 minus f of p it's just a probability that the value is at least p. Okay. So we know that uh, 
If you sell the item for only one round using a truth or mechanism, the best thing you can do is to sell it at a fixed price and let the buyer pick whether to buy or not. And basically, the optimal revenue is captured by this term. But what is the um, gain of the buyer? This is the revenue for the seller, right? Yeah, so, so in this work, we focus on the uh, view of the seller. Basically, the theorem two is saying that you're not going to prove theorem, theorem one for all the no regret learning algorithms. If the, somehow the buyer is doing some weird no regret learning algorithms, then your revenue won't be very high. Right, but is he motivated to use it? Is he doing better than little of t in his? Is he doing better in theorem two than in theorem one? So is he getting? So more in theorem one, yeah, it, it's definitely better. Uh, yeah, whatever it is, what is the buyer utility in this no regret learning algorithm? So, for example, if uh, buyer is using this strategy, then from the seller's side, a, no matter what you use, you won't get uh, a lot of revenue. You might just use uh, some trivial strategy that you don't change your uh, sure, what parameters you, over time. Is the buyer better off here? Is he motivated to use this algorithm? Let's say seller uh, uses a fixed price strategy. Yeah, so the, in that case, and then buyer uses this particular algorithm A, what is the buyer utility in this case? In theorem 2, right? Yes. So uh, basically, if the buyer is using this strategy, the seller will just uh, sell it at fixed price over time. So whatever buyer gains in that case, the buyer gains also the same here. But anyways, in theorem one, the buyer is getting very little, like a small of t. But in theorem two, he's getting something linear. In yeah, it's getting something like non-trivial. Yeah. So you can at least avoid the awkward situation in theorem one. All right. Uh, in end, uh, we study the scenario when the buyer is the same as theorem one, but there's an additional constraint, the buyer never overbids. Okay, so what happened in theorem one is that uh, actually the buyer will learn to overbid because it looks good in the beginning. Uh, and we think it's not very realistic because in many auction format, overbid is never a good option. <coughs> Maybe the buyer will just no regret learns over all the options that smaller than the value. Okay, then in this setting, we characterize the seller's optimal revenue by a linear program. And uh, it's basically between the terms of theorem one and theorem two. Okay. Okay. So what do you mean simultaneously? You mean for some distributions, it's unboundedly better than this, and for some other distributions? So there exists a distribution, it's unbounded better. Like, also, unboundedly means uh, you mean linear, the ratio depends on the distribution. So you won't get some constant approximation that's not that's not dependent on the distribution description. So it depends but on- But there are two different distributions, right? One there exists a, one distribution. One distribution. distribution. Yeah. Uh, you will see, yeah. So it's basically the equal revenue curve. So theorem three says that if you never overbid, theorem two will not happen. Like I don't, I don't pass all these- Theorem one won't happen. Theorem one. Yeah, so if uh, bidder uh, never overbids, theorem one won't happen. But the bidder is still using a mean based algorithm. Uh, so, yeah. so you can still get some revenue better than the trivial one. All right. So, so now how should I understand all these three theorems together? Because you said in the motivation that like, like buyers will use some no regret algorithms. Yeah. So do they use the one in theorem two or one in theorem one? I would think like if the buyer so since the buyer is using a no regret algorithm, probably the buyer will simply use something like theorem one or maybe theorem three. But theorem two is for like illustrating that you won't prove this thing for all the no regret learning algorithms. Because once a buyer tries to reason about the strategy, maybe the buyer will do something even more smart. Like it's not clear if the buyer will still use a no regret learning algorithm or not. Uh, maybe the buyer will use this one because no regret learning algorithm works well if the seller uh, strategy is fixed over rounds. So maybe the buyer will use this. Yeah, not exactly. The buyer should use. Yeah, if the actually if the 
yeah, if the seller strategy is fixed over time, the buyer should use a no real value learning algorithm. It's uh, pretty good. So what you're saying is the what no regret learning algorithm matters, which one matters? That's the yeah. message. Yeah. It's not, not all of them are same. Yeah, I'm, so my, yeah, the point is that if the buyer doesn't think too much about the scenario, just uh, pick a no regular algorithm, blindly use it, then maybe it will result in something bad. And if the buyer thinks a little bit more, then at least the seller won't get the good revenue and the buyer will be guaranteed something. All right. Um, so the plan of the talk is to show you an example to illustrate these three theorems. Okay, so it will be a specific distribution. Uh, it's very simple, there are three values. It's one quarter with probably one half, one half with probably one quarter, and one with probably one quarter. Okay. So the optimal one-shot revenue in this case is one quarter. For example, if you sell at price half, uh, the buyer will pay with probability half so you will get the revenue one quarter. And the expected uh, value of this distribution is one half. Okay. There's some gap between these two values. Okay. Um, so first, as a sanity check, I want to show you that there exists a very simple strategy for the seller to guarantee at least a one-shot revenue. So at least a one quarter in this case. Uh, so basically, the seller just uh, uh, set two bidding options. One is uh, charging the optimal reserve minus epsilon. So it's like optimal fixed price for the one-shot uh, mechanism. So in this case, it can be one quarter, one half, or one. And uh, I do this uh, minus epsilon because uh, so there's no problem of uh, tie-breaking. And if the bidder chooses this option, the bidder always gets the item. And there's a zero arm. So notice that this strategy doesn't even change over time. Okay? And what will happen to a no regret buyer, if the value is larger than this reserve, uh, the buyer will learn to play option one. Okay? We'll mostly play option one, otherwise uh, the buyer will get a lot of regret of not playing option one. And similarly, if the value is smaller than the reserve, the buyer will learn to play option two. Okay? So um, in this case, the seller can at least get uh, this uh, one-shot revenue. Okay. So actually, if you think about it more, if the seller use a fixed strategy over, uh, over time, then this is the best revenue you can get. Okay. So it seems that there's no problem of using a no-regret algorithm, no matter what no algorithm you use, if the seller doesn't change strategy over time. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to show you how to get more revenue from a mean-based uh, uh, buyer. Okay. So what does mean-based mean? So it means that uh, in each round, if there's an option, an arm, that has average utility over all the previous round much larger than all the other arms, then this mean-based algorithm has to uh, choose that strategy choose that option with a very high probability. And in some sense, if uh, the average utilities, so if there always exists an arm with average utility much high, higher than other arms, then this mean-based <coughs> algorithm actually behaves like always pulling the arm with the largest uh, mean. Okay. So in this talk, you can just think it as uh, always pulling the arm with the largest mean. Right. And uh, recall, we show that if the buyer is using this strategy, then we can get the full welfare. Okay. So now I'm going to show you the strategy. This strategy uh, does not get one half, but at least get something better than one quarter times t. Okay. So there are only two bidding options. One is a zero bid. You don't get item pay zero. Uh, the second one is you bid one and you always get the item, uh, but in the first half, you pay zero. In the second half, you pay one. Okay. So this is like, in the first half, it's like a free trial, and in, in the second half, I ask you to pay money. Okay. 
So let's see what will happen with this strategy. So when the value is one quarter, um, it's definitely good to be zero in the first half. You gain one quarter in each round. Uh, in the second half, you lose uh, three quarters in each round, but you will still beat for like t over six rounds because uh, the average utility of bit one is still better than bit zero. So you will not uh, uh, immediately switch from bit one to bit zero. You will switch after t over six rounds. I, mean, I, I don't understand something. So, so the arm, when, when he switches to this uh, charging half, right. I mean, this has to be announced, right? The, the, the yeah, it's time. not announced. That's a point. So for, if you participate in an auction, right? I won't tell you how I change my reserve price. You will, you will see the result after you beat something. Okay. Okay. So, that's, uh, so that's why the but beater is using no regret learning. Yeah, but in what sense it's the same arm? So suppose I bid one and I get the item for free and I did it many times. Now I bid one and, uh, you know, I, and I, I'm charged a half suddenly. So I don't view this as the same option as bidding one and getting it for free. So I'm not going to, I mean, you're um, thinking of this as the same arm, and it has this wonderful weight from t over two steps, but now it's... it's the same it's, action, right? Your action is... Well, it shouldn't be viewed as the same action. It's, it's, it's really new. Because so I guess it's problematic so, if yeah. just in this round, I charge you like infinity amount, right? I only charge you, my, my charge is bounded, and you can still learn over time. So like, okay. what you're losing one round is not a big deal. And also like they, they did, they, okay. I mean, I, I, you can change the results. So the, the, the no regret assumption is that the process yeah. is stationary, whereas it's not. Okay. Sorry. I, I guess another way, if you can change the price like gradually, maybe that makes you feel better. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, okay. So the other complaint about this, this is that it depends on the horizon t. So is there a trick that yeah, yeah. you can so, make so that it doesn't depend? So on the t? yeah, in our model, yeah, we need to know how long it is, and somehow it's like uh, depends on the number of rounds or something. But yeah, we just want to illustrate a simple case. Um, all right. And if your bid is, uh, if your value is one half, you will just uh, bid the uh, one from the beginning to the end. Uh, because it's always a better option than bid zero until the very end. But in the end, they are the same. Okay. If your value is one, you will also bid one till the end. Okay. So let's uh, calculate the revenue. Uh, so if your value is half, uh, is one quarter, you're paying for t over six rounds, and uh, one quarter happens with probably half. So you get uh, revenue t over 12, and you can do the same thing for the other values, and you will get t over three, which is larger than t over four. Okay. So what, where did the additional revenue come from? Uh, one way to think about it is that if you look at the, this bit one, it's on average, it's charging you half. Um, so it makes sense that value one, value half, will choose it. But because we have this sudden change of price, actually value one quarter is paying for some number of rounds. Okay? If we charge one half in each round, then value one quarter won't even participate in this bid. So that, that's where, where we get the additional revenue. So what happens if you assume that the bidder is running one no regret learning algorithm, where the agents, the experts, are mappings from value to bids? This is, uh, does it still hold? You're assuming there's a different no regret for each value, but suppose there's one regret, one algorithm, and yes. actions are functions from values to right. bids. So I think when, so, so you can think this value as context or like contextual bandit. And when there are not many contexts, one way to run no regret learning is to run them separately. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the 
also the later the the, the second uh, algorithm I will show will use uh, information all around. So maybe you will get I guess close to your idea. Right. So okay. So all right. Uh, see the second result. We show that there exists a tailored learning algorithm that uh, prevent the seller to get uh, additional revenue. Okay. So what's the algorithm? It's not very different from the normal no regret learning algorithm. You still run the no regret learning over all the possible bits, but also some meta arms. Okay. So meta arm BJ means that you beat what what you would beat if your value is uh, is VJ. Okay. All right. So we show the theorem saying that when buyer uses this algorithm, then the uh, optimal revenue will be small. Okay. So here's some uh, intuition why this will work. Um, so if you look at the no regret uh, constraint. When bidder vi doesn't uh, regret of using meta arm bj, it means that the buyer with value vi is at least as happy as if they pretend their values was bj. Okay. In some sense, it looks very similar to the incent incentive compatible constraint. And uh, what actually happens in the proof is that we show that if the seller can get additional revenue against a tailored uh, buyer in this setting, then we will get, uh, we we'll do some reduction and we'll get a uh, uh, one-shot truthful mechanism that also get additional revenue, which is not possible. So here the seller cannot get uh, additional revenue. Okay, it's a very vague idea. Let's uh, also go through the example. So we will still look at the same uh, uh, seller strategy, but now the buyer is using this tailored learning algorithm. Okay, so what will happen? Uh, for value one quarter, the buyer will still beat. Uh, will do the same thing because uh, actually the strategy doesn't change. The okay. for value one half, the uh, buyer will have three options. One is beat zero. One is beat one. And the third is a bid as value one quarter. So you bid one until time two t over three, and then switch to bid zero. And uh, what happened is that now for value one half, this is uh, always the best strategy. Um, it some, sometimes have tie with the bid one, but uh, it's not a big deal. All right, and let's see. And uh, for value one, we just upper bound the. Uh, Revenue by t over two. Okay, so let's see the what the revenue will be. So, still, uh, value one quarter gets revenue t over twelve, but now for value one half, you only get revenue t over twenty four. Okay, and if you sum them up, it will be uh, t over four. Okay. Uh, so basically, what happens here is that. Uh, remember, we use this seller strategy to try to get more revenue from value one quarter. But now, because you're trying to get revenue from value one quarter, now value one half, we also use the same strategy, so you will lose some revenue in value one half. This is the second result. And finally, we are going to see the third one. Uh, so now the buyer use some mean based uh, algorithm, but never overbids. Uh, okay. So Matt come up with names to put his photo here. Uh, and remember, this is a result. We get some revenue in between. So now I'm going to just show you the optimal strategy. So there. Uh, Actually, three bits. There's another bit, bit zero. I just uh, ignore it. Uh, if you bid uh, one quarter, you, in the beginning, you don't get item, and you pay zero. And after t over three, you get item and pay one quarter minus epsilon. 
if your uh, if you beat one half, you always get item and pay one half minus epsilon. Okay. So uh, let's see what will happen in this case. If your value is one quarter, you will just beat one quarter um, because you don't overbid. Uh, if your value is one half, you will beat one half to t over three round, and then you will switch to beat one quarter very quickly because uh, you don't get any utility. You get very little utility in the beginning. Okay? And uh, for value one, in, uh, you will just uh, keep beating one quarter, one half. It seems to be uh, the best uh, option. Okay. So, okay. So what's the revenue here? It's um, something complicated. Uh, Basically, the answer is that uh, it's something better than 1 over 4. And uh, it's not even as high as uh, 1 over 3, which we showed in the previous example. So you don't get that much revenue as a uh, normal mean based uh, buyer. Basically, you cannot, even, you cannot uh, expect to get full revenue because uh, they, no one overbid. So in the beginning, whenever you lose some uh, Value you just won't get it back. Okay. So, so there are some uh, observation of uh, this strategy, this optimal strategy. So you always pay a bit if you get item. So this is like a first price auction, and the only change over time is that the minimum winning bid will decrease. Okay. So basically, it's like running some uh, first price auction, and uh, we just keep decreasing the minimum winning bid. And uh, we show that this is the uh, optimal strategy. So what is the proof like? The proof basically um, upper bound uh, this revenue by some linear program. And then we show that the value of this linear program can be achieved by this uh, specific uh, strategy. Okay. Right. Um, okay. So finally, as I said, uh, this we want to understand, characterize uh, this revenue, which is characterized by the linear program. Um, we call it the MB ref. So more concretely, we show that when the value distribution is supported on 1 to h, um, this is known. So the value of the distribution is at most a log times the revenue. This is known before. Uh, we show that the MB ref is at most log log h times the revenue. And more importantly, we show that there exists a distribution such that uh, both inequalities are tied. So you get uh, this separation. So basically, the, the gap between uh, this MB rev to value or the revenue it won't be bounded by constant uh, independent of the distribution. Okay. Uh, all right. So to summarize first half, uh, in theorem one, we show that if the buyer simply use a mean-based learning algorithm, the seller can extract full welfare. Then we show that if the buyer is using some uh, tailored learning algorithm, then the seller cannot get the non-trivial revenue. And in the end, we study some uh, more realistic setting that the buyer never overbids, then the revenue will be in between, and we characterize it by some linear program. Okay. So this is the uh, first half. Now I'm going to talk about the different project. Okay. So um, okay, the problem is very simple. You want to find the top k items from a set of n items, and uh, you can make you're not uh, you're allowed to make a pairwise comparisons, and these comparisons are noisy. Okay, I'll tell you the noise model later. So uh, the problem is motivated by applications like uh, crowdsourcing, peer grading, and recommender system. So let me give you a more concrete task. So I think this is a very important task on crowdsourcing. So you have some data. Possibly you also get them from a crowdsourcing platform. And you want to find the good quality ones via crowdsourcing. So what you will do is you will just ask uh, crowdsource workers to make pairwise comparisons. Okay. And their answers can be noisy. All right. All right. So um, 
to design algorithms, we want to minimize uh, sample complexity. This is pretty obvious. If the, so this means uh, how many comparisons you make. So it's pretty obvious because it's directly related to how much money you need to spend on the crowdsourcing platform. Okay. There's a less obvious one, which is uh, round complexity. Okay. So let me first define. Um, so can you, can you please define what is top k item mean in this case? How do you define this? Top so, k? Yeah. so let's say you have n items, and they have already an underlying order. Yeah. And you don't know the order. Oh, okay. so Assume the user, they have an order. But the users know this order when they are. The user have some knowledge. Maybe it's not very accurate, but yeah, they. Okay. Yeah, I I defined it in the noisy model, so you see like what they can do. Okay. But uh, they have the underlying order that's uh, fixed, but you don't know. Okay. All right. So uh, what do I mean by round complexity? So basically, in each round, the algorithm needs to send all the comparison queries simultaneously. So it means that your, uh, the pair of items you query cannot depend on some other queries uh, answer in a single round. Okay. So you need to send them all together. And uh, you can classify algorithms into many categories by the number of rounds. I think uh, inactive algorithms has zero round because you are not even allowed to choose what comparisons to make. And for active algorithms, there's two extreme cases. One is a non-adaptive, you only have one round, or you have no constraint. So the fully adaptive case, you have no constraint on the number of rounds. Okay? So back to the question, why do we care about the round complexity, or why do we want to minimize it? So the observation is that uh, there are many crowdsourced workers online. And they can work in parallel. Right? So if you are not asking crazy amount of queries, the amount of time you need to spend to finish your crowdsourcing task is uh, decided by the number of rounds, not the number of samples. Okay? So we, we don't want the number of rounds to be too big. All right. So in this work, we study the trade-off between the sample complexity and round complexity uh, in the presence of uh, noise. So it's like trade-off between money and time. All right. Uh, now I'm going to define the noise model. We study very simple noise models. Uh, the first one is erasure. So each comparison is erased with some probability. Okay. So it's like the cross-source worker said, OK, I'm not sure about this question. The another noise model is uh, just called noisy. So Oh, by the way, for the erasure case, uh, if uh, the answer is not erased, then it's always correct. Okay? And in the noisy case, the answer can be incorrect, but each comparison needs to be correct with probability at least half plus gamma. Okay? So back to your question, it's like this is what the uh, crowdsource worker know. Crowdsourcing. They're just noisy comparisons, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's a multi yeah, yeah, one story. I mean, yeah. You can think of it as just noisy comparison. <laughs> but I guess uh, now people like crowdsourcing. It's also useful. Um, all right. Like just, I mean, it feels like it should have been looked at in the, yeah. the 80s but, or 70s. But the rounds, so it was looked at a lot, but the, but the point of view of rounds was not looked yeah. at until the last few years. Actually, I'm just about to talk about some related work. Um, so there are two very related ones. The first one is uh, uh, so they, uh, by Balabash and Brightwell. They study exactly the same problem. They want to find the top k. And they study the trade-off between sample complexity and round complexity. But they did, did not study the noise. Okay. Maybe they don't get the crowdsourcing to motivate the problem. Uh, there is another one that's also very related. Um, they study top K and also some other similar problems. They actually study the case with noise, and, uh, but they did not consider the round complexity. And uh, yeah, at that time, they were motivating the problem by something like NBA tournament. But now we can talk about crowdsourcing. All right. So now I'm going to talk about the results. What was the motivation for 
Google version right now? So they basically want to just uh, find top k. I don't know what, but they in a parallel like uh, computation. I think voting rules also. Okay. Actually. Yeah. Also, they use some um, graph theory. That's very interesting. Uh, all right. So here's our result. First, we look at the uh, one-round algorithms. Um, we show that they perform pretty badly. So sometimes you are forced to use one-round algorithm because uh, time is really important. For example, if you want to use pairwise comparison to review conference papers, you probably don't want to do it in multiple rounds. Otherwise, the conference will happen in the 10 years later. Or something. Um, all right. So we show that if you don't spend much more than a linear number of comparisons, you have to make uh, these many mistakes. Okay. Um, so we show algorithm to achieve this bound, and we also show that they are tight. So here, uh, in the eraser case, you get the 1 over gamma, and uh, in the noisy case, you get the 1 over gamma square. So the quick intuition of this thing is that uh, if you... Sorry. What does these mistakes mean? Oh, okay. Okay. Mistake basically means that you output something that is not in top k, or you did not output something that is in top k. Yeah, but what? So one mistake means like you output one number that is not in top k, or you, want, uh, you, you did not output a number that is not in, that's in top k. So why do you depend on k? Yeah, like in our, oh. it's, you're saying that if I want to recover like top right, right. one, so, then. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, so in our work, we assume that k is like uh, theta of n, and also n minus k is also theta of n. So like, you want to output maybe top half, maybe, just for this talk. But as long as k is uh, theta of n, uh, so our result only works for that case. I mean, I would imagine the other way around, like I want like top 10 or something. Okay, so our result also work for... So you, you always can do minimum with k for, for the number of things. So. <laughs> yeah. Also, okay. Yeah. So top, okay, so, top so one you won't find exactly. Top one is uh, definitely easier than top k. Uh, so for yeah. top k, if you want to solve top k, you can add some additional, uh, in, uh, additional items and find the top half. Right? If you want to find top one, you can add uh, like n minus one additional items. Then you solve the top half, and you will get the top one. But uh, the thing is that we are not getting the optimal dependency on k. But uh, you definitely can use our algorithm to solve like uh, <coughs> top k for small k. It's just uh, maybe it's not good dependence. So that will just give you the min of this with k because the once the dummy items will always be present, maybe. Yeah. And the ones you really care about, they are not present. So. Essentially, you're getting min of this with k, which would be min minus k. Yeah, so, yeah, this is a lot of mistakes, right? So, if k is more, then it's like pretty minimal. So, in, you have theta, so you have both an upper and lower bound there, right? Yeah. For each of those. But, yeah, the lower bound is for like uh, k equals to uh, n over 2. <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting to solve the problem for like uh, arbitrary k. All right, so this is a one round result. Uh, and then we study the case for multiple rounds. We want to get zero mistakes, okay, in this case. Um, so first of all, it's known before that you can use, uh, there exists a four round algorithm with linear, linear number of comparisons that uh, gives you zero mistakes, okay? It's first proved by them. And uh, in this work, we get a simpler algorithm, but uh, they, they definitely first prove it. And they also show that it's not possible to do it in three rounds. All right. So four rounds doesn't seem to be too bad. Uh, all right. Then in the erasure case, we directly get a four round algorithm with uh, n log n over gamma number of comparisons. What do you do? So you just uh, use this four-round algorithm, and you repeat each query by logging over gamma times. And then you know that with high probability, each pair is not erased. So each pair has at least one 
non-erase the comparison. Okay. Uh, here, here is in, in, in multiple rounds, you can query the same guy. Yeah, can I see. Okay. Uh, Even in the same guy. Actually, most of the results. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess most of the results can be turned into some uh, case that you don't query the same pair. But yeah. Okay. Uh, so by information theory, it's very easy to see that you at least need n over gamma number of comparisons. Basically, because the uh, erasure comparison only conveys gamma information. So it's not clear that whether you need this login or not. And uh, the answer is actually you don't need this login. So if you spend a little bit more round, you can remove the login in the number of comparisons. So here log star is the iterated uh, logarithm function. So it doesn't seem to be many rounds. And we show that if you really want the n over gamma number of comparisons, you need these many rounds. Uh, finally, for the noisy case, uh, for the same uh, reason, you can get a good four-round algorithm. Jane, but if I have really constant four or five rounds, do you know what is the truth there? Do you need to log in or not? Yeah, I don't know. See, yeah, five round, five round probably I can. Of course, five is bigger than log star n for all n you'll ever encounter, but. This is theory, so if you have a fixed number of rounds, four or five, do you need n log n over gamma or n over gamma? You can't do n over gamma, that's what this is saying. Yeah. This is but a theta or log star n. What? No. So it's theta. So no, both it's not theta. There's no theta. It's theta, log star n. So he's saying n. So if you want n over gamma, he's saying you need log star n. Yeah, so if you really want n over gamma, you need the log star n. But if you want something in between, then I don't know what's the yeah, right thing. Like for n over gamma, you really need log star. Yeah. Log star. There's a lower bound. Okay. Uh, the theta was another the number of But phi round n log star n over gamma is possible. Five <laughs> round. <laughs> I'm just switching these to be okay. What yeah. Like that or is or maybe n or a little. Put yeah, log exactly. again at some point. Yeah. yeah, but in some sense, I feel log star is not very large, but yeah, for realistic settings. Um, but all right, okay. Back to the noisy case, we show that the same story does not happen. So even fully adaptive algorithms need to have this log n factor here. Okay. Yeah, so basically, in the noisy case, you'd better just use this for run algorithm. Okay, so these are all the results. And compare with a one round algorithm. So if the one, one round algorithm uses the same similar number of comparisons, then that algorithm needs to make a lot of mistakes. Basically, either omega of n or n over log n. Maybe this is not too bad. All right. Um, good. So my plan is to show you. Uh, one round algorithm to give you some flavor of like how this algorithm works. Okay. It would be a very simple case. You want to find the top half. It's even in the noiseless case. Okay. So okay. So what do you do? The first idea is that if you want to find the top half, we should just compare everything to the median. But uh, actually, since we allow some mistakes. You probably just want to compare to some approximate median. Okay. And uh, this seems not hard to do if we have two rounds. So what do we do? We yes, like to like if I don't know, so so why is the top k the right problem and not just sorting? Uh, so, so sometimes order. like you just want to select the the data with good quality or you just want to select paper with good quality. Yeah, sorting is also an interesting problem. Uh, but uh, seems uh, yeah, because this for all these questions you should like I mean yeah you yeah. can ask this for sorting and yeah I you should, should yeah uh, but sorting always it could be harder it's probably harder I think sort sorting somehow is easier to prove lower bound usually especially uh, yeah, number yeah, of rounds yeah. and log n noiseless but then does it stay and log n noisy I, I don't know yeah yeah, yeah it should always so, start sorting but so you can just do every comparison until you're sure of it so 
So yeah, but then the n log square, right? So then, so then, so then there's n log square. Then. Yeah. It's uh, sorry. Yeah, so sorting is also interesting, yeah, but somehow it turns out to first study. And, and, and you can easily well. show you need the log square because if you want the sorting to be up, it's short. Didn't Matt had a paper, follow up paper for, on sorting? Matt? Yeah, I think that was the stock paper. They actually studied sorting in the similar form. Uh, I don't know the okay, yeah, but I think this, this is a stock paper. And with Matt. Uh, okay, so maybe the next time. Yeah, there. Yeah. In anyways. Uh, all right. So, what do we? How do we find the approximate median? Sorry. How do we find the top half? So, if we have two rounds, it will be easy. So, we first pick uh, r randomly pick a skeleton set of size square root n, and we compare each pair in this skeleton set in one round. And then after this round, we will just look at the median of uh, this scattering set. By some uh, concentration argument, this median will rank close to the actual median. So in the next round, we can just compare everything to this element, and then we will solve the top half uh, with some mistakes, small, like n to the 3 quarters. And uh, so now the question is, how do we make all these things in one round? Okay. Uh, so here's the algorithm. We still pick a skeleton set of the size square root n, and we still compare each pair of the elements in this skeleton set. But in the same round, we also, uh, for each element that's not in this set, we compare to d minus 1 random elements in S. Okay? The reason we do this is because we don't know which one is the median of the skeleton set. So we, we, what we can do, so the best thing to do is just compare some random elements. Okay. And uh, so how do we output? Basically, it's similar to the two-round algorithm. If we know that uh, for any out, uh, Sorry. For any element that's outside the skeleton set, if we know that it beats the uh, median of the skeleton set, we will say, okay, it's in the top half. If we know it's not, then we will say it's in the bottom half. Otherwise, we just uh, do some arbitrary answer. It doesn't really matter. Okay. All right. Uh, so how does the uh, proof work? It's actually simple. So one, one question. Mm -hmm. So in all your results, is there some confidence on the actual ranking? Like the first element will never go out of. But like uh, suppose I'm getting. No, that okay. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, we we consider them like equally important. I guess. Yeah, because like if I think this as my paper evaluation, then you know like our paper right. reviews in a conference, you don't want the first guy also to be like go out of it and over to yeah. like. Not all mistakes are equally. Right. But. Uh, yeah, the algorithm actually only makes mistakes uh, between, like uh, close to the middle, like. But we never try to make it formally. Uh, I guess it will. So actually, the algorithm probably won't make mistakes on the first guy, but we uh, did now try to prove something. But like, your algorithm really is sort of like not taking into this account, right? Because you're just okay. So okay. back to this one, right? So. Okay, the mistake only happens in the middle, right? Because I'm just, right. So the first one will always be position correct, but uh, yeah, uh, we did not try to do it uh, more carefully. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like uh, for conference paper review, the borderline paper is really messed up. No, that actually makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, so back to the analysis. So basically, if element i is compared to some element j that's in the skeleton set, and the, the j is between i and the median of the skeleton set, then we will later figure out that i is better than x. Right? So basically, we just try to bound our error probability by the probability that uh, such j doesn't exist. Okay? And then if we sum up this term, you don't need to parse it, you will get n over d. So it's actually pretty simple. All right. Straight so, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, 
So the mistake, so the, the number of ones that are placed wrong in this example into the three quarters? Into the... So, oh, you mean the, the, the... This one is like A over D. So if D is a constant, it's like <coughs> linear in N. So the previous example is for two rounds. You get the uh, n to the three quarters. Actually, you can make it even down to n to the one half by a more complicated strategy. But uh, for only one round, if d is a constant, you get a linear number of mistakes. We can also show a lower bound, uh, but uh, it's different from the algorithm. Uh, all right. Uh, so here's some uh, idea for the in the noisy case. So you will. It becomes a harder problem. You don't necessarily learn the median of the scattering set, and some useful comparisons will be erased or flipped. And we need to more complicated uh, strategies, but I don't have time to talk about them. All right. So I end up with some future directions. Uh, uh, for the first project, uh, direct open problem is that I want to study what happens if you sell to multiple no regret buyers. Uh, one hard thing there is that now you have this competition, so it's not clear how to allocate items uh, in a good way. It becomes much harder than the case when there's only one buyer. And also, it's hard to study when there are multiple no regret algorithms are running at the same time. They have uh, weird interactions. And uh, okay. we study some uh, similar problem some problem in a similar flavor. So this problem is like uh, mod. we consider a principle is running a multi-arm bandit algorithm, but the arms are strategic agents. So each arm, uh, if get pulled, will get some private value, and the arm can decide how much to give to the principle. And uh, the arm try to maximize the total sum of this uh, value they keep for themselves. Okay. And in our work, we show that in certain settings, you only get very bad negative results. Basically, the principle cannot get a lot of value. But uh, it would be interesting to get some positive results in some reasonable setting. And more in general, I'm um, very interested in the, this direction of uh, learning with strategic agents. So uh, there's more, uh, there are more like su successful stories if the strategic agent only participate in one round of the game. So usually, it's easy to reason about because uh, the problem usually is just a two-level structure thing. And the problem becomes harder to reason about if the strategic agent participates in many rounds with adaptive strategies. Okay. All right. And for the second project, uh, one related problem is to study some uh, similar problems, like sorting uh, approximate top K. Actually, I'm very interesting. Approximate top K seems very... Uh, close to top k, but uh, now you're instead of outputting k elements that are in top k, you are allowed to output k elements that are in top L, where L is uh, slightly larger than k. And we want to understand whether the problem becomes much easier or not. Okay. And there are also some other problems, like you study more complicated noise models that are like more close to humans' behavior. All right. All right, thanks. Since we are slightly over time, uh, let's take more questions offline.